Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. It's time to take global stories making headlines in our national dailies. And joining us to review the papers is Professor Kamilu Sanifage. He's from the Department of Political Science by Yero University, Kanu. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, and thank you for having me. Thank you so much. All right, so let's start with the punch this morning. And the punch leads with fuel, foods lead as imports hit 12 trillion naira. Now, the writers on this one says manufacturers import 1.5 trillion naira raw materials. Food imports gulp 921 billion naira. Another one says Nigeria gets 19 trillion naira forex from crude, solid minerals, exports, others. So we're looking at, you know, fuel and food as the main things that we import in Nigeria. And these are two commodities, if I may say, that we have, you know, ab an abundance of because we have crude that we sell. We're, we're a nation that is blessed, you know, with this um, natural resource, which is crude. And then we're supposed to have, um, you know, refineries that should be able to just refine this crude and we have the the fuel which is the pms the dpk we have diesel we have kerosene and we have petrol we also are blessed with you know fertile lands to be able to grow our own agriculture um to be able to grow our own food to be able to have a leading um, agricultural sector but then these are two major things that we import in nigeria and then the the, the, the to the tune of 12 trillion naira what do you think the government is doing about this? And if you were to advise the government, you know, on how we we're supposed to tackle this, what would you say? Because if these are major commodities that we know that we consume, one, and two, that we are kind of blessed with to be able to be, um, to be able to have our own, that is growing our own or refining our own product, why are we still importing this much as of today, which is 2024, for a nation that is over 60 years. What do you have to say on this? You see, why, why we are importing these basic things is uh, negligence mm. uh, from uh, the government. Because it is quite unfortunate that uh, an oil producing country and a country that is blessed we say you know abundant land and good weather and uh, you know so many things that uh, uh will be uh, exporting food items but unfortunately for us we are importing these basic things this shows that our economy is uh import dependent so what the government ought to do and what the private sector ought to do is look at uh, the, the basic uh, which is why don't we have you know necessary industries not we don't have to go into gigantic things but basic industries you know that uh, can enable us to you know manufacture and process the oil that we have so that we can meet our own needs, so that we can now produce food that we can feed ourselves and uh, export to others. Unfortunately, if you take like food, if you take uh, like uh, Nasarawa, Niger, Kano, and some few states, they can feed Nigeria and they can feed even West Africa. And yet, despite this, we are importing uh, food and fuel. And uh, look at the amount. 12 trillion naira, which means uh, our economy will continue to be in shambles and uh, our people will continue to be, uh, you know, in a state of hunger and dependency, which is uh, unfortunate. So I think uh, the government and the private sector should look at this and seriously uh, pay attention so that we get out of this because a nation that cannot feed itself is not only a liability but i think it's in a very precarious uh, condition it is a dangerous situation where a country cannot feed itself yeah um so there's even another headline here still on the punch that says local refining may crash petrol price 
to 300 naira per liter and that's modular refineries so while we're not looking into this if we know that we have um, the capacity to be able to refine our own and fine it might not be um, the major refineries that we have such as you know Port Harcourt refinery Wari refinery Kaduna refinery um, if we know that we can have some modular refineries and it could actually crash the price why are we not looking into that why are we still looking to importing this commodity with such exorbitant amounts Simply, is corruption. You see, uh, because people make a lot of money out of this, mm. so that is why they will not allow the modular refineries to work. That is why they will not allow even the national refineries to work. Even the Dangote refinery that uh, is about to start uh, working properly, they will not allow it because some people literally cabals gain from that so that is why they will not allow it uh, allow all these things to work otherwise you see like i said earlier on it is unfortunate that we after 64 years of independence we are still importing basic uh, things so i i think uh, the reason is corruption and people are benefiting both within and outside the government so that is why they they, they wouldn't uh, allow it to work and that is why you see even those within the government will now pass it on to the ordinary person you know when they talk about subsidy about subsidy that some cabals are uh, you know benefiting now they pass it on to the nigerians and the ordinary people and still the cabals are benefiting which shows that uh, the government, by showing this, uh, is admitting its own failure. Let to deal with uh, such cabal. So I think uh, that is the basic reason. Corruption is the basic reason why we are not able to, uh, you know, process uh, such uh, even small things like our own our oil need. So what's the way forward? I mean, if we've already narrowed it down to say corruption is the reason why, how do we go from here? Because we cannot just continue to wallow in this. At some point, you know, people are going to reach their breaking point. If people are pushed to the wall and they see that, you know, these things that we need, we're not able to afford it anymore because every single day the prices of goods and services are increased in the market. Um, with the petrol, obviously, the federal government is possibly paying some form of subsidy. But when they decide to take that out, what happens? So if we know that corruption is the main issue, what are we supposed to be doing? How do we move from here? If we're saying we want Nigeria to move forward, how are we supposed to do that? If we're still staying yeah. here and saying, you know, it's corruption. Yeah, what we need to do first, we should have the political will to face it head on. Uh, because if we don't have the political will, uh, we'll continue to be taking one step forward and uh, maybe three steps backwards. Mm. In other words, we'll not be progressing. Because the fact that uh, we don't have the will to address these uh, issues, that, that is why where we are now, we, we just make the fight a uh, window dressing. Because the global world, now the world attention is uh, focusing against corruption. So that is why we joined the bandwagon. But not with sincerity, not with all the effort that is required for us to do it. So a simple thing is, let's have the political will to now face this issue of corruption. And uh, if we do that one, I think we'll be able to make a, a headway. Because unless unless we address it, mm. you know, we cannot uh, be able to make any headway. Well, I hope the government is listening and they're looking at how to address this because we just can't, we can't stay here and just stay and just say, you know what, yes, this is what's happening. We need to be able to make headway, like you've said. Um, there's another headline that says, marketers register with Dangote Refinery ahead of loading. So hopefully um, this commodity is going to be easily accessible to people. I don't know if it's going to be able to crash down the price um, of fuel, but hopefully something is going to be done about that. But now let's move over to electricity. This one says, states work on total electricity subsidy removal 
and new tariff. What do you think about this? Because I know that a few months ago, um, you know, the Minister of Power had come out to say they cannot afford to keep paying electricity subsidy. And so, obviously, that was taken out from Band A customers with about over 300% increase on their tariff. Now, we're looking at states to work on total electricity subsidy removal and they will definitely have, need to have a new tariff. What do you think about this? And what is going to mean for Nigerians, especially when we're still in the talks of the minimum wage that hasn't been set yet? You see, it is going to plunge us into more problems because electricity and uh, fuel are the major energy source, yeah. uh, you know, for even uh, industries to take off. So by the time you raise it, uh, you know, you are now make it unaffordable already. We are seeing many industries either closing or packing their things and closing their shop and leaving the, the, the country. So I think this is a very counterproductive thing, uh, which is a myopic thing by uh, saying we have to increase it. After all, uh, one of the demands of the labor is the issue of, uh, you know, this reversal to the old uh, rate. But here we are, instead of addressing the problem we are saying we have to go deeper and deeper into it so i think that uh, the, one of the consequences will be like i said we go deep into uh more economic crisis our industries will close will shut down unemployment will be higher and then the labor crisis will continue so all the major socio-economic factors uh, will be on the negative side and if care is not taken you know okay, we don't know what will happen nobody is uh hoping and predicting you know the issue of social arrest but by the time you push people to that level already hunger is there there is unemployment there is here inflation and by the time you compound these problems nobody knows where uh the things will stop Oh, well, um, let's look at minimum wage talks. So on the punch, it says minimum wage talks end today. Labor awaits Tinubu's nod. However, on the Guardian, it says ILO conference may stall minimum wage talks as leaders jet out of the country. Well, wh would I say right timing or wrong timing for them to actually jet out when we're supposed to be talking about, you know, how people are supposed to leave and their living wage. So what's what a coincidence that they need to jet out at this point for the conference. I would have thought they would have decided by now what to do because this has gone on for too long. What do you think? Uh, right now, we're having reports that the federal government is proposing about 62,000 naira. Labor is ask asking for about 250,000 naira. But if we're still waiting and dilly dallying for this long, that means we might not get anywhere. What do you think about the fact that, you know, the labor and the federal government has been, as, uh, they've been at this for such a long time and they've not been able to make any headway? Yeah, you see, it's, it's because there is no sincerity of purpose in, in, in the whole negotiations. Mm. Uh, actually, you know, when the government said, uh, the president said he's going to offer something above uh, 60,000, uh, 60, mm -hmm. one expects that the government would come with, out with uh, something substantial. Yeah. But uh, they somehow make it um, uh, 62. Uh, so there is the agreement between the government and the private sector. On the other hand, the governors are saying they cannot uh, afford to pay uh, more than 60,000. Uh, so you see there is a kind of uh, collaboration, if we can call it, between all these sectors. And as far as the labor uh, is concerned, by jetting out, I think they, 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 that is not... Uh, Good. That is not correct, and that is not right for them to get out, even though it is an international conference. But mm -hmm. conference, you know, you can attend another one. Even though I read that one of the officials who didn't want to be courted uh, said that uh, part of the reason is they're expecting if there is telemet that there is going to be perhaps a, a, a crisis. So if they are not there, they say that the government will not uh, blame them for uh, fomenting the uh, crisis. But whatever it is, I think it's unjustifiable uh, for both uh, sides, especially for the government, to be dragging its feet uh, in order to stall this.
one of uh, one unfortunate situation that um, I can read is about um, the governor's position. Uh, it depends of their place. I mean, their position that they cannot, uh, they should not be forced to pay anything above sixty thousand. One of them just quoted. Uh, he said, "Vermont and uh, California, their governors are earning uh, about uh, two hundred thousand per annum, and then uh, places like Mississippi are paying less to their governors." He said, "If there is no such a uh, thing, uh, uniformity, then why should we, as a federation, not copy uh, from what is happening?" But I think that is is uh, is misleading. Because mm. the part they are talking about is a minimum wage. If, even in a federal state like America, like Germany, or any other place, once the minimum wage is agreed upon at national level, state must comply with that. They cannot go below the minimum wage, but they can go above the minimum yeah. wage. I don't know what it is now, but I know in the past it used to be in America, it was $6 per hour and it the, over the time it reached up to $13 uh, dollars per hour. So no state can pay a minimum wage less than that uh, what has been agreed. So I think, you see, this is why I say there is no sincerity of purpose. Everybody on the government side and on the private sector side, they are bringing things to Sure. And uh, the other side is also the government is um, considering threat or is using threat uh, that uh, this is a sabotage, is something mm -hmm. to the extent that uh, I think ITUC has to come and say, OK, Nigeria is, uh, is threatening uh, the labor for their own uh, right to demonstrate. So I think um, what we need to do is on both sides, especially the government. They should be realistic. They should know the condition of the people. It's either they give uh, an affordable minimum wage, or most importantly, let them address the issue of inflation and hunger. Yeah, so that even if they want the minimum wage to be below 30, but if these things are affordable to the ordinary person, that is what uh, people want. Mm. I agree with you. I think addressing the, the root cause of the matter is what they should be looking at, not even um, whatever figure it is. But if you look at Edo State, Edo State, you know, had come out to say that they're willing to pay 70,000 naira. Do you think the federal government should be given a figure that is even lower than what one state has decided to pay? How does that work? Yeah, you see, that's what I'm saying, that uh, at least the government knows very well uh, that uh, it, it is even 70,000, they cannot be uh, able to, you know, sustain a person for a month. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but the, the way I say that is this gang up, look at even Lagos State. Uh, the governor said he cannot pay more than 60, that uh, it is not uh, affordable, you know, for him. Mm -hmm. All state, Lagos to say that they cannot afford uh, beyond 60. So, you know, if you look at all the 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 the, 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 uh, the statement of the governors and the people who are involved, you know there is a, a connivance, there is a gang mm -hmm. of, and uh, actually it is a dangerous thing. By the time you push these things uh, to such a level, you don't know what will happen. After yeah. all, the government itself depends on the worker. Uh, on the workers now mm -hmm. if you impoverish them you stop them how can the government work uh, that is why even though i don't agree with uh, father mbaka he said that uh, even the governor should now come back to the minimum wage of 62 thousand but i think this is showing how frustrated nigerians are yeah. with this process so the, the sooner the better for the government to come up with a very realistic uh, situation so that we put this at the, uh, out our back and continue to forge ahead and face other challenges in the country. Yeah, I think they're just trying to um, make the whole process tiresome so you can just accept whatever you know they throw at you because I don't understand why minimum wage talks would take forever. In fact, the last one has ex expired in April. And so this is, a, this is June for over two months, of which these talks, has, you know, they've been having these talks since last year, actually, with labor threatening to, to protest and go on strike and all of that. And so I don't know why the federal government is taking this long. And it's quite, you know, weird for Lagos, 
that is the commercial capital of the country to say they can't even afford um you know si um, over 62,000 naira meanwhile a door state who's not doing as much as lagos is willing to offer that so i'm sure you know all of these um governors they can but then they just maybe decide not to and you know look for how to move away from that talk and so whatever we throw at you you just have to take that all right. Anyways, let's move over to the um, major story on The Guardian. And this says rising cost of borrowing. Economy in throes of credit squeeze shed 7.1 trillion naira in three months. Now, um, it talks about interest rates, bank um, recapitalization, and all of that. But what do you think about this story? Rising cost of borrowing. So we're supposed to be cutting down, you know, costs. At least any same country would do that, especially when you're not doing so well. In fact, if you take Nigeria as a business and if your business isn't doing so well and you're not making profit, you would think of how to cut down, you know, costs to be able to fit into the amount or the figure that you have to spend. But yeah, we see that we keep having to borrow a lot of times. And so this headline says rising cost of borrowing and the economy is in throes of credit squeeze. What do you think about this? 7.1 trillion in three months. Well, shedding 7.1 trillion in three months. What do you think? Isn't that a lot? How are we not supposed to be finding ways to ensure that we even cut the cost of governance here? Yeah, this is this is what I say when I give the word political will. That we should have the will. The reason is, you see, uh, once you have problem, you, you you just lament about it. Uh, you are not going to address the issue. We are lamenting. You know, we are saying we have this problem, but we are yet to take a decisive uh, step to address the situation. One way by which uh, countries all over the world, even if it is individual, uh, they try to uh, address this kind of thing is, if there is economic crisis, you cut down, okay? Yeah. Uh, you cut down uh, the expenses. You cut down so many things unnecessarily. But look at Nigeria. Uh, one, uh, you know, we are saying we have this problem. We, we now go deeper and deeper, borrowing more money in order to continue to sustain what is a realistic impact. Look at the size of the government. When we come, this is the largest government that we ever have in our own history mm -hmm. with uh, 48 ministers and all the expenses of them. And look at what the government has been dishing out uh, in various ways to the political uh, officer uh, appointees, uh, to politicians and others. Literally, they are creating or they have successfully created a two uh, Nigeria in one. The Nigeria of the politicians who are now wallowing in, uh, you know, they're all in squandering in riches. And then the Nigeria of the ordinary Nigerians who are now wallowing in poverty. So the government will always say, or oh, it has been saying that it doesn't have the resources to address uh, the ordinary people's needs, but it has the resources to waste on their own thing. So if we want to cut these things, the passing is for the government uh, to now cut uh, expenses, unnecessary expenses. Uh, that is one step. And the second step is to, you know, uh, also cut down these unnecessary taxes, you know, uh, because they also increase to, you know, uh, the issue of economic uh, crisis. And then, like we say, we look at, uh, how do we improve agriculture? How do we improve our own industry so that we make, make our basic needs? But when we continue to borrow, uh, you know, we are, will be going deeper and deeper into the economic crisis. Mm. I hope they're really doing something about this. I hope that they understand the importance of having a thriving economy. And whatever you need to do to push yourself out of whatever crisis it is, 
um, is imperative. So we cannot be borrowing or we cannot be having a bloated cabinet or we cannot just be having frivolous spending saying, yes, we'll borrow and it's fine. We need to think of the future. We need to think of, you know, how are we going to, what Nigeria are we going to hand over to our kids or the next generation to come? So it's important that we start to look for, a, a father definitely wants to leave a good legacy for their kids. They want to leave wealth, a generational wealth for their kids. And that's what I expect the Nigeria government should be doing ensuring that you know we have more money for our for the next generation for the generations on bond not saying that we are you know having to borrow so much money and say the next generation can be in debt and we really don't care so it's important it's important that we're really looking at these things critically and not just moving you know moving along like nothing is happening Okay, so let's talk about, um, you know, something else which talks about the next generation, really. And this says, Kanu declares emergency on education. Says 4.7 million pupils sit on bare floor. Now, you are joining us from Kanu, so you have more, um, you know, in-depth knowledge on this. Kanu states, have declared, they've declared um, uh, an emergency on education. And talking about, you know, the next generation, of course, we need to educate our kids. Do, why do you think that the federal government isn't looking at this as much as we expect them to? Because knowing that the kids are the future of Nigeria, why are we not trying to invest so much in their future? What are we doing? What do you think about this story? Yeah, you see, you see the the kind of story. I think is uh, perhaps one of the good news that uh, here in Kano people will be happy with, because by the time the government says that they have a clear state of emergency on education, this is something that we are all uh, looking forward to. Where you know, for long we have been urged the government and the leaders, not only in Kano, but in Nigeria, that uh, the state of education in Nigeria is in such a situation that we need uh, to declare a state of emergency. So by the time Kano said this thing, I think this is a very good thing. It's a positive thing in the uh, right direction, which I think is not only Kano, but Nigeria as a whole, uh, we should declare such things. Uh, because the, of the simple reason that no country in the world develops above the level of its own education. You see, after 64 years of independence in Nigeria, we are yet to even settle primary school education, talk less of other level. So I think this is the reason why uh, the government at all levels should declare such a state of emergency. Otherwise, we are living in a fool's paradise. You know, our uh, elite, our leaders and the elite think that uh, by the time they just focus and concentrate on their own children, um, they, they neglect the others. I mean, the children of the ordinary person, uh, they think they will now love them so that when they train their children, uh, they will come and also lead. Listen, I think I will, I will not put it rightly. The son of the driver, the son of this and that, are denying uh, education, mm. will not allow the children in the future to live. So I think it's better, uh, even for collective interest, for the country, uh, all leaders, to pay serious attention to education. And one of the ways that we can pay is to declare a state of emergency and, uh, you know, pace it squarely. Here in Kano, the government already. Uh, dedicated, uh, I think almost 30 percent is 29.9 percent of the budget on education, and now there is this declaration. And um, you know, we should not only allow the government sector to do uh, this declaration will mean that the private sector, individuals, you know, uh, the government and everybody should come together, put their hand together in order to salvage education uh, so that we, the glory of the past uh, mm. will revive it. Right. I hope that they really do that because, you know, we always say that um, our children are the leaders of tomorrow. So what kind of citizens, quality citizens, do we want if we're not really investing so much in their education for tomorrow? Okay, so let's look at two things that, you know, the president is trying to do. One of them is on Nature News, and it says, Sinibu's minister unveiled, unveiled climate actions for Nigeria. So 
obviously climate change, all of that is happening with our environment. So there are certain actions that they are trying to unveil. And then on the business NG, it says um, a small headline on the top. It says Sinubu vows to further rejig financial system for prosperity. So what do you think about these two things? One is about our environment and another is about our financial system. Obviously our economy isn't doing great at the moment, but he vows to rejig you know, the financial system for prosperity in Nigeria. Do you think most of the time this is just um, lofty ideas or things that they just say in the building sandcastles in the air um, and not really doing anything? Because so far we've not really seen so much, even though they've asked us to sacrifice and tighten our belts. But what do you think about this? The president saying he's going to further rejig the financial system for prosperity and then the ministers having to unveil you know, actions for climate change. You see, the, you see, we are very good at uh, policy promises and uh, proposals. Where we are lacking is in terms of implementation. It is good. These two issues are very important and very vital uh, for us and uh, for the country. But the reality is they may go back as uh, they, they may suffer the same pit with all other promises that uh, uh, we have been doing in Nigeria. Look at uh, what happened. Even within one year, I uh, I don't know if uh, uh, this will be an interesting thing. Uh, if we can now study how many promises have the government made, especially the president, from the day he was sworn in to date, how many has he made, and which one, if at all, uh, is addressed. So I think. Promises, they are lofty, they are good, they are something that uh, will help, uh, you know, uh, will go a long way in terms of improving Nigeria's situation. But the reality is we have to admit it that um, they will not be able or they will not be ready to implement what they have said. So by next year or by sometimes you see they will still be there that uh, we are planning to do X, Y, and Z, and nothing will be done on, on them. Mm. All right, this is such a good way to end it. Um, I want to say thank you, Professor Kamilu Sanifagi. Thank you for coming and reviewing the papers with us this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. We've been speaking with Professor Kamilu Sanifagi. He's from the Department of Political Science, Bayero University, Kano. And we've just been taking global stories, making headlines in our national dailies this morning. We'll go on a short break, and when we return, we'll be looking at our next hot topic. And this talks about Serap suing Tinubu and demands details of Obasanjo, Buhari, and others' loan. Please stay with us. <laughs>